Okay, thank you, Andreas. So, uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, everyone. And as I explained to you, that uh, we have uh, West lecturer. Uh, he is Dr. Andreas Opens. Uh, and we will have all the meeting is uh, five, yeah. So this is our first meeting. And I will share to you, I already shared to you previously the topic we will discuss. And I will share to you the revised versions uh, I got from uh, Dr. Ufen. So today, uh, right now, we are going to discuss on one of the electorals, one of the system of the electoral uh, system, namely mixed member proportional, where the Germany adopt the system as its electoral systems. Yeah. And just 10 days ago, yeah, Andreas told me that Germany uh, had, yeah, successfully yeah, organized its elections. And today, Andreas will share to us what's going on uh, in Germany and what is uh, the situation at the time under the corona situation and uh, what we can uh, get from the German uh, electoral systems. Uh, Dr. Andreas has a lot of uh, academic writings, yeah, spreading in all various uh, publishers. You can find in uh, Google Scholar, in Google search engines. Yeah, he is right now living in Hamburg. Yeah, uh, one of the foremost city in Germany. Yeah, and his concerns is about Southeast Asian uh, politics, mainly Indonesia and Malaysia, and of course uh, a lot of other, a lot of his uh, academic write articles discuss about political parties, election, demo uh, democracy and so on and so forth. So I wanna thanks to Dr. Andreas Upen, uh, who want to give a public lecture to our students under the course of electoral government. So right now, uh, time is yours, at least between 30 and 45 minutes. And after that, we have Q&A session and then I wish the students and uh, the other invited uh, participants can prepare uh, the questions about the German, the latest German uh, election. Time is yours, Dr. Andreas. Yeah, okay, thanks very much. Um, I try to enter my PowerPoint presentation. Is this. Can you see that? Can, can you see the PowerPoint? Yes, sir. Okay. So, uh, thanks very much. I'm talking today about Germany's electoral system and the elections of September 2021. The elections were actually 11 days ago. Sunday the week before and um, we will have a new government in a few weeks time probably led by the Social Democratic Party that's the first time since 2005 when Schröder um, lost uh, the elections. Um, so I will start with um, talking about the system of government in Germany, the parliamentary system, then a little bit uh, about political parties and the party system in Germany, then of course the electoral system, mixed member proportional, 
and then um, about the elections uh, 11 days ago. Um, for the next, for this session and the next four sessions, I would um, propose to uh, look at these three websites, the ACE project, then IFAS and International IDEA. Uh, on these websites, you can find almost everything on electoral systems, on party financing, on everything you would like to know about block vote or single non-transferable votes and proportional representation and so on. Yeah? And they have not only smaller pieces, but they have reports and books and everything can be downloaded for free. So this is really, I think, the best um, data pool you will get. For example, the ACE project has data on any country in the world, also on, on Indonesia, of course, and also in, uh, I, international idea. They, for example, have a database on party financing. So, I mean, these websites are even better than most books, I would say. Um, so I would start because I don't have so much time with the parliamentary system in Germany. Um, and I would only um, tell you that in franchise people 18 years or more are electing um, the federal diet or the national parliament, yeah, something like the DPR in Germany, also called federal diet in English. Um, and the federal diet, the, the national parliament elects the chancellor um, and the chancellor, of course, selects his own federal cabinet here on the left side. Um, the president in Germany is not really important. It's more a kind of figurehead. He or she, so far, we only had men as, as presidents, is elected by a so-called federal convention. Federal convention is right. like M is a bit like MPR, not really important. So the president is only more a symbolic figurehead. Um, you can focus on the federal diet, the national parliament and the chancellor, but um, people also elect on the right side, the state legislatures. In Germany, we have 16 states. They are a bit like provinces, but much more powerful. And the state legislatures elect the uh, minister president and the minister president and his cabinets select members of the federal council in the middle and the federal council is a bit like dpd but again much more powerful yeah so these are the main mechanism of the parliamentary system in germany um so these are the 16 states of Germany. The 16 states um, have their own constitutions. They have their own constitutional courts. Um, of course, they have their own parliaments. Um, and they appoint the 69 members of the uh, Federal Council or Bundesrat, the uh, DPD, if you want. And I'm from the one in, in the north, the city state of Hamburg. Um, yeah, I think that's enough. If you have any questions, just ask. Yeah, you can also ask in between or write down and then uh, use the chat function or maybe uh, Rido will, will um, gather the questions. I don't know. And the um, electoral system in Germany is a quite specific one. I think only Germany and New Zealand have this mixed member proportional system. <laughs> this MMP system combines a closed list proportional representation system with majoritarian um, with a majoritarian election system. I will explain that in a few minutes. We also have a five percent threshold. So now we have in Parliament, I think, seven or eight parties. And they usually have to uh, get at least 5% of the votes. There are some two minor exceptions. Maybe I will talk on that later. We have 598 regular seats. Um, 
the half of them, 299 are elected directly in constituencies. Yeah, 299 constituencies spread all over Germany and one in each constituency is elected directly. And the other half, the other 299 are elected via uh, lists. Yeah, maybe not like in Indonesia, but like in typical list proportional representation systems. So it's a mix of a majoritarian system and a proportional system. But we have more than 598 seats. Now we will have 735 seats. That means 137 seats more than we would have regularly. And these additional seats are called overhang and compensating seats. That's a very difficult process. I will explain it at least partly. I think 99 of 100 Germans do not really and fully understand this system. It's, it's a bit complex. And that's one of the difficulties with our mixed member proportional system. Nobody really fully understands it. Um, so in the last session, the fifth session, I will talk more on the different electoral system families and all the different types and subtypes um, that exist. Um, I'm now referring to uh, the international idea handbooks. There's one on the left side from 1997 and another newer one from 2005. And in these very helpful international idea handbooks, you will find almost everything on electoral systems. And I would suggest to, to read them, yeah, at least partly. I mean, it's very complex. You, you cannot... Um, immediately understand everything but to get a notion so i actually like the older version from 1997 a bit more um, in this version they differentiate between plurality majority systems on the left side on the right side proportional representation and then there are so-called semi-proportional representation systems um, and the German system, according to the diagram on the left side, MMP, is um, a type of proportional uh, representation. That means it's not really a mixed one. It's essentially proportional representation, but with an element of plurality. So in this case, on the left side, the German system is proportional representation. And the German term also says that the, the German term is personalisierte Verhältniswahl, pers personalized proportional system, something like that. That means it's a proportional system with a personalized element. But on the right side, you will see that MMP is categorized as a mixed system. Yeah. So you can also say it's, it's a mixed system because you have these two different elements. Um, and this shows you that um, the classifications or categorizations of electoral systems are different. Yeah, But I would say the left one is better. It's, it's actually proportional representation. A, a mixed system would be a so-called parallel system, like in Thailand and the Philippines, where you have... Uh, where you have a real... Um, yeah, disconnected um, mechanism, two disconnected um, ways of, elected, of electing representatives. But I will come to that at the latest in the fifth session. But you can have this in mind. The German system is uh, somehow in between the pure plurality or majority system and the pure proportional rep representation system. Some would say it's a it's a mixed system. Others would say, no, it's, it's essentially proportional representation. So I'm coming now to political parties and the party system in Germany. According to the federal um, constitution, political parties shall participate in the formation of the political will of the people. It's very 
strange definition. What does that mean, political will? But okay, that's another question. They may be freely established. Of course, their internal organization must conform to democratic principles. That's very important. They must publicly account for their assets and for the sources and use of their funds. Also very um, important. That means they are democratic. Yeah, there's a democratic decision making. You cannot just select your leaders at will or by acclamation. That's what Indonesian parties sometimes do. No, it's it's very strictly um, regulated, and if it's not democratic, the party may even be banned. Yeah, and the other thing is. Um, Political parties in Germany are mostly financed by the state, state funding. They get some private donations, but they have to explicitly um, write down where the money comes from and where the money, where the money is used. And this is also um, very important. So transparency is, is um, one of the um, essential principles of party funding in Germany. Um, so an oligarch would not, not really be able to build his or her own party and then, well, um, establish it um, from scratch, something like that would at least be difficult. Now, I think it's possible, but it's difficult. So in Germany, we have a multi-party system characterized by well-institutionalized parties. Yeah, that means usually they have branches all over the country. In every village in Germany, there's a branch of the Social Democratic Party, for example, and they would meet at least once a month or maybe every week and would talk about politics. Um, and they pay membership fees. So there's a real strong connection between um, party members at the grassroots and the party um, in general. Um, there are strong cleavages. I will talk about that in a few minutes. Yeah, between left and right wing parties, libertarian, conservative, and so on. But there's also, like in almost all countries in the world, uh, a phenomenon called de-alignment of parties. That means the connection to voters and members, it's getting looser over time. I will show that in a few minutes. So very shortly, I mean, the first German parties were established in the late 19th century. The Social Democrat, Democratic Party, SPD, for example, was established in 1875. So they have a very long tradition. And this is part of the institutionalization because of that, the identification with the party is very strong. Other parties like the Christian Democratic Union, the other big one was established after the Second World War, but it had some predecessors. For example, a party called Centrum or Center that was a Catholic party in the, in the first German democracy, the Weimar Republic. And then we have some left parties, Die Linke, and Die Linke was partly or did partly belong to the Social Democratic Party until 2000s, but it is also a heritage of the East German socialist state. Yeah, When the old SED became the PDS and then later the left party. But okay, this is only to give you a notion of, of what kind of parties we have. I will talk about that later. These are all the main results of German elections since 1949, after the Second World War. And um, you will see that the two big parties have always been the red one, the Social Democratic Party. It's the Labour Party, more left-wing. And the black one is the Christian Democratic Union, together with the Christian Social Union, these parties are belong together. The CSU is the CDU version in the southern part in Bavaria, but, but that's not very important. And you see that 
for example, the CDU once had more than 50% in 1957 and, and even in the 1970s and early 1980s, the Christian Democratic Union and the CSU together had almost 50% and the Social Democratic Party had more than 40% in the 70s. Together, they had sometimes 90% of the votes. Um, and then there was a smaller party, the yellow one, the Liberal Party, FDP, and these three parties were um, dominant in the German party system. And in the 1970s and maybe yeah, 1960s, 1970s and early 1980s, the German party system was called a two and a half party system. Two big ones and the smaller one, the Liberal Party. And the Liberal Party would build coalitions with the CDU and later with um, the Social Democrats, then again with the CDU. So this is how coalitions have been built for a very long time. But at the end, you see in the last 10, 15 years, the party system in Germany is fragmenting. Now we have six, seven different parties, the three ones from the 60s, 70s, 80s, and then that there's the green one, the green party, um, focusing on environmental issues, climate change, and so on. Now very strong. And then there's a right-wing populist party, the AFD, Alternative for Germany, the blue one. And then the left party, of course, the, the red one um, uh, at the bottom. And then you have all these chance chancellors until today, Angela Merkel, the first woman from CDU, and before different chancellors from SPD or CDU. Now we will have probably a chancellor from SPD again, from Hamburg, Scholz. Um, and I said there are strong cleavages in the German party system. Cleavages means um, not ethnic cleavages, not important in Germany. To an extent, a religious cleavage. The CDU is more religious than all the other parties, but religion is not really important, I would say, in, in German politics. Yeah, maybe the Bavarian CSU is quite Catholic. That, that plays a role, but mostly um, it's not about religion. Also, electoral campaigns are about taxes and economic policies and climate change and all these, these things, but not really about religion. But, but of course, voters and supporters of parties are living in social milieus, and these milieus are characterized also by connections to, to the church or, or by, by rather secular um, uh, lifestyles. So you have more libertarian parties like the FDP, yeah, pro-market, and then other parties who um, are more focusing on distributive justice, solidarity, and so on. The left party, to an extent, the Social Democratic Party. Um, yeah, and, and you have on the right side, the alternative for Germany, which is more against migration. It's a bit um, xenophobic nationalist. Yeah? But you can have this in mind. These are, have been the different leaders of the political parties during the campaign. Um, usually German parties have two people at the top. That was invented by the Green Party usually a man and a woman, but now other parties have followed. Even the right-wing populist AFD has two people at the top, one woman, one man. The, the Liberal Party is the exception. SPD here has had its own so-called chancellor candidate, Charles, but they also have two people at the top, yeah. Um, you don't have to read this. This is only to give you a notion of how detailed um, political platforms are. This is only about energy and climate policy positions of the different parties yeah, on mobility, energy taxes, and so on. And every party in Germany 
has very detailed platforms on energy and climate policy, on security policy, on taxes, and so on. So if you vote for a party, you usually know exactly what you get. Yeah, what you see is what you get. And this is, I think, a major difference to, to all Southeast Asian countries and parties with some exceptions in, in certain policy fields, of course. Um, okay, you have then coalitions in Germany, then they, they change their policy positions to an extent because they have to find compromises. And I said there was a de-alignment of political parties. There are three indicators of de-alignment. First, a shrinking party membership. You see the Social Democrats, for example, had more than a million members in the 1970s, and now it's half of that. Although Germany is bigger now after, after the reunification in 1990. And the same is true for the Christian Democrats. Green Party is different because it was established only in the 1980s. And, and yeah, the Liberal Party is also quite stable. But usually this is a European phenomenon. In all European countries, as far as I know, the membership is shrinking and that means the connection between members and party leadership is not as close as it was in the 1970s and 1960s. Another indicator is a decreasing voter turnout. It was only around 70% in 2009. It was more than 90% in the 1970s. Um, but now this year it was 76.6, so it's, it's normalizing to an extent. But all in all, voter turnout has been decreasing a bit over the decades. Um, and then another indicator of de-alignment is volatility. Um, for most of the time, people would vote for specific parties and you would be a member or a supporter of the Social Democratic Party from birth until death, usually. Now you are switching in between parties. That's what I'm also doing. And in the last 10 months, nine months, you could see how people um, were switching to one party to the other. For example, the CDU had almost 40% in April. April, May, and so on. But now, um, 11 days ago, they only had 24%. And the Green Party was leading in the uh, national surveys in, what is it, in May. In May 2021, the Green Party had 26%, something like that. Because of that, they had a chancellor candidate for the first time, a woman, Annalena Baerbock. But then because of some mistakes in, during the electoral campaign, the Green Party has lost a few percentage, percentage points. But volatility is quite high. That was not the case 20 or 30 years ago, no? a volatility like, like this. So I'm now coming after this short part on parties and the party system to the electoral system. So if we go to the polls, like 11, days ago when I was electing here a kilometer away I had two votes the first vote is for the candidate in one of these 299 constituencies Hamburg has for example six constituencies and I voted in my constituencies for a specific person and my second vote was for the party uh, the political party and that's all you have to do in Germany, you are automatically registered. You get um, a postcard or a letter a few weeks uh, ahead of the elections. And with this letter, you go to the um, polling booth and then you can vote. So it's, it's quite easy. Yeah? And you can see on the right side, 50%, uh, 299 are elected directly and the other um, 299 are elected via lists. So the, the political parties in Hamburg have their lists of um, 
candidates and it is a closed list that means the spd for example in hamburg decides who is number one two three four and so on it's not a an open list like uh, in indonesia so you, you could talk about which which system is better closed list or open list they all have advantages and disadvantages of course but we have these two different types of systems coming together because um, those who have invented it thought that um, a direct connection to um, the person who has been elected directly is good for um, representation because you feel close to this candidate and uh, that means the national parliament the bundestag is not somewhere far away in berlin you have a direct connection in in, in my constituency a german with turkish origins um, has won directly with 30 something percent from the spd but actually um there is no real direct relationship. I have never seen this woman and I have never been to an event where she was. And that's what, what many people criticize. We have this plurality. Yeah, it's, it's a plurality system actually, because you don't need 50% plus, but you need a simple majority or plurality. This plurality system maybe does not really work. Yeah, maybe in the southern part of Germany, but here in Hamburg, well, it's a bit um, questionable. And the other thing is the party then has two different types of uh, members of parliament, those who are elected directly and the, the people who are voted in by a lists. And these produces two different types of MPs with different... Um, forms of legitimation and this could also be a bit tricky within the party itself so um according to the newer version of the international idea handbook it's a mixed system proportional representation plus in this uh, case plurality i already talked about this mixed member proportional um yeah I don't want to repeat this. Yeah, I think I have already told you. It's it's list proportional representation, list PR plus plurality. But you can see these definitions all in, especially at the ACE project um, uh, website. They have a glossary, and you can find everything on what is block vote and so on. So. Um, if you look at a map of Germany, you, you can see here, for example, who has won where. On the left side, you find the 299 um, constituencies. And yeah, some peoples are very strong in certain parts of Germany. For example, in the southern part where everything is blue, the Christian social union is very strong they have won almost all constituencies i think 43 out of 45 or something like that and then um i think these are the results from 2017 so because of that i'm a bit confused these are the results of 2017 but not not so different from 2021 i couldn't find those from 2021 but you can see here on the left side, B is, for example, Berlin. Berlin, the left party, um, is quite strong. This is a heritage of the socialist state, where in East Berlin, everything was located uh, from the socialist state. And then the Green Party is also very strong in Berlin, because there are these alternative left milieus, especially in the center of Berlin. Um, the western part is more well traditional conservative the cdu has won a few constituencies and then of course there's spd also in the center so you can see even in the cities there are um different regions where different parties are stronger 
Um, okay. I, I told you that uh, 598 people have been elected into the German parliament, the Bundestag, but we have actually 735 um, members of parliament now. That means 137 um, are entering the parliament via so-called overhang and compensation seats. Yeah, you can see at the bottom, um, these seats go to different parties. Um, in Hamburg, for example, in Hamburg, we have six constituencies. That means six people have been voted in directly, four from the Social Democratic Party and two from the Green Party. And then you have another six who are elected into the parliament via the uh, list proportional system. Yeah? But you also have overhang compensation seats so that at the end, from Hamburg, 16 people entered parliament, five from the Social Democratic Party, four from the Green Party, three CDU, two Liberal Party, one AFD, one from the left party. And um, it's a very complex system. I don't want to um, annoy you with um, detailing how it works. But for example, if a party in Bavaria, for example, if the CSU wins in Bavaria 43 out of 45 uh, constituency, constituencies, it means 43 people are entering parliament directly. But actually, the CSU did get only 30 something percent in Bavaria. So actually, they should get less than 43 seats. Yeah? And in order to um, compensate these um, imbalances, the other parties get a few seats in addition. Yeah, so that the proportional representation at the end is fulfilled. That means it is actually a proportional system. If, for example, the um, AFD wins around ten percent, they also get around ten percent of the seats in parliament. This is guaranteed via overhang and compensation seats. And this is actually really the case here. Um, you see that, for example, the Social Democratic Party won almost 26%. That means they will get 26% more or less of the 735 seats. I mean, it's a bit more because there are 8.6% percent spoiled votes, votes for other parties who did not enter parliament. So that actually the Social Democratic Party had almost 26 percent out of 91 something. And that means it's actually they would get around 30 percent of all the votes, a little bit less. And that means at the end they got 206 uh, not votes, 206 seats. Yeah. So it's, it's proportional representation, um, but the way people uh, were elected was partly via um, a plurality system. So this is the German system. It has some disadvantages, but well. And now, um, after the elections, um, the chancellor candidate of the SPD does not automatically become chancellor, no because he needs the majority in the national parliament, in the Bundestag. Because of that, um, he has to build a coalition. And there are now, I mean, now 24 hours on TV, people are talking about which coalition will we get in the next few weeks. Most probably is a so-called traffic light um, coalition. SPD, red, the green screen, and uh, the Liberal Party, FDP, um, yellow. Yeah, that's very probable because they together have um, 26, 40, 52 percent, something like that. Yeah, and, and of the seats, they have maybe 55 percent, something like that. So that would be a very good majority in parliament. And a chancellor in Germany needs a strong uh, majority in parliament in order to 
to govern effectively. Yeah, sometimes you have uh, minority governments, especially in Scandinavia, but in Germany we never had. Yeah? I think even at the state level, only sometimes. And another um, possible coalition would be Jamaica. Jamaica because of the colors, black, green, and yellow, but not very probable. But um, we could, of course, also get another grand coalition, a black, red, or red, black coalition. That's what we had over many years. But people do not really like it because it's, it's a, a bit like a cartel of the two big parties and all the smaller parties are marginalized. So most people hate big or grand coalitions and we will uh, uh, not get a grand coalition this time because it's so unpopular. So am I already at the end? Oh, how many minutes do I have, Rido? A few. Okay, I, I will close with this. The advantages and disadvantages of mixed member proportional systems, at least the one in Germany. Um, I mean, the good one, that's what, what many experts thought, you have the best of both worlds. Yeah, Direct representation is very good because you feel closely connected and proportional representation is very good because it really reflects um, the mood in society, yeah, and and it includes smaller parties, and that also means it, it includes social groups that are otherwise would be marginalized, like in the U.S., where you only have two parties and and no Green Party, no Left Party. That's not very good for representation and also for establishing sharp programmatic profiles. So in Germany, you have the whole menu of um, policy positions and they are reflected in parliament and in parliamentary debates. That's very good, I, I think. Um, but as I said, the disadvantage is it can create two classes of legislators, those directly elected and those voted in via lists. But I think it's not really a problem. Then there are so-called strategic voting anomalies. Yeah, very often in Germany, you vote for, for a specific candidate, but for a different party and things like that. Or you vote for a party because you think they should get at least 5% in order to build a coalition with my favorite party. So it's very often strategic voting. In contrast to plurality systems, where you only have two choices and no strategic voting. But I think the strategic voting is maybe not bad. I mean that gives you more options to vote. Um, of course, proportional representation means a fragmentation of the party system. You know, it was quite easy in Germany, two and a half party system in the 60s and 70s, but then the whole system fragmented. Now you have six, seven different parties and it makes it more complex, at least, and especially the coalition building. It's a very complex process. In 2017, they tried to build a so-called traffic light um, coalition. I think it was a traffic light or was it Jamaica? Maybe it was Jamaica. Maybe I'm wrong. But at the end, the, the Liberal Party said, no, we do not really want it after, after a few months. And then everything fell apart and then they built a grand coalition again. So coalition building is very difficult. Um, and the, the, of course, the major disadvantage of the German system is the thing with the overhang and compensation seats because nobody really understands it. Um, and, and it's too big. I mean, we have 735 MPs and if there would have been more overhang seats in different parts of Germany, we could have easily um, have gotten more than 800 um, members of parliament. You do not know how many members you will have and well, it could be too much. They try to um, reform the whole system during the last few years, but of course, MPs are not really interested in reforming it. They want as much seats as possible because then they could get more jobs. Because of that, 
reforming is very difficult, but I think in the next few years, they will reform it to an extent. I think 500 members of parliament would be much better than 700 something. And in the German system, the linkage between candidates and voters is actually not very close. Yeah, so we could also have a fully proportional representation system. I think maybe the, the difference would not be that big. So that's it. Thanks very much. So I have to stop okay. it. Like this. Thank you very much. Uh, Andreas, for your uh, interesting presentation about uh, the latest German uh, elections. Before I allow to the participant to ask you, maybe I have uh, one, yeah, one question. I, uh, I hope I have to, but the thing. I will give you one question. Yeah. Do you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. It's, it's not very clear, but it's it's okay. Okay, it is clear? It's better now. Oh, okay, because I just use um, a speaker, yeah. Ah, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, the question is uh, I mean uh, what is the public respond with the winning of SPD. It is because just a little bit different with the CDU, yeah? Uh, CDU, uh, SPD uh, received 25% and then uh, CDU 1% uh, less than, yeah, 24. I mean, uh, what do you think? It is. Uh, it will be stable in the uh, further election that uh, SPD will gain its uh, triumph uh, in the 25, yeah, in the 2025 election. Or what? What the driving factors? Why uh, SPD uh, being a winner? And what about the rise of AFD? Yeah, AFD. Mm. Uh, do you mean uh, this is the time for the, I don't know, this is the left uh, things, the left force of Germany? I mean, because Pegida, yeah, uh, one of the influential movement who reject about uh, uh, refugees because uh, Merkel policy is allowed to refugees and Muslim communities come to Germany. Uh, even that uh, German, uh, Germany and under Merkel have a good uh, policy to, in dealing with uh, coronavirus. Yeah, I think mm. other countries uh, appreciate with the German policy how to deal with uh, this uh, global pandemic, but why Merkel party uh, have decreasing vote in uh, 21 election? I want to know no, no. Uh, about that from you. Thank you, Andreas. Yeah, okay, good questions. Um, first, um, we have a parliamentary system. That means we don't have presidential candidates and um, the thing is that we have uh, chancellor candidates, yeah? So these people do not directly become chancellors, but um, political parties um, push one person who would be the chancellor if the party would win and would form a coalition, something like that. Usually we have two chancellor candidates, one from CDU CSU and one from SPD, but this time we had three, one from the Greens because the Greens were so strong in May when they got a majority in the surveys. So the Green had Annalena Baerbock, a woman, young woman, once a student at my university at political science. And then there was Scholz from SPD, also from Hamburg, uh, actually here from my 
Oh yeah, really? From from where I'm in in Hamburg, I mean, he was he went to school just a kilometer away. Okay. And then the third one is Laschet. Laschet was Minister President of North Rhine Westphalia from CDU, and and this is very important. Laschet was seen as a very weak candidate. He made many mistakes during the electoral campaign. He was laughing when there was flooding in parts of Germany. He should not have done that. He he did not make um oh he did not give a good impression to most voters. And because of that, um the CDU has lost a lot of support. And Annalena Baerbock was very popular at the beginning, but she also made many mistakes. For example, her CV was was wrong. There were some strange, strange things in her CV. And she wrote a book, but there was a lot of plagiarism in that book. And people found out. And so she lost a lot of support. And because of that, the Green Party um, lost uh, around 10 percentage points since May. But Scholz of uh, the Social Democratic Party is, is a bit dry and a bit boring, but he seems to be very competent. And well, his, his electoral campaign was simply very good, I think. And the whole SPD electoral campaign was very good. But, but this can change quickly. I mean, the CDU will have a new leader maybe next year because Laschet is, is too weak and then everything can turn around. And, and the, the Social Democratic Party was very weak for the last few years. They only had around 15%. And now they, had, now they even have 28% according to the last survey. But this is a Scholz phenomenon. It's only the, the candidate, I would say. And... Yeah, this is the most important factor. The AFD has less um, than in 2017, 10 point something percent. Why? I think because migration is nowadays not a real issue any longer. We only have a few thousand um, migrants per week or per month. So we had a million in 2015, almost a million. But now, over the year, maybe 100,000. I don't know. So it's not a real issue, and that's difficult for the AFD. And Corona, Corona was maybe not that important in these elections, but AFD was the only party that was or put, portrayed um, itself as being skeptical um, with regards to fighting the pandemic, uh, especially regarding vaccination. I mean, in Germany, you have many people who don't want to be vaccinated. And if you ask them why, you only get some strange answers because, well, the effectiveness is not clear or whatever. There are also some conspiracy theories that, that Bill Gates wants to implant, I don't know, <laughs> some electronic devices via vaccinations or whatever. Yeah? So that's why, especially in Eastern uh, Germany, in the Eastern part, um, only 50, 55% are vaccinated, although um, everybody could have been vaccinated. Yeah? It's, it's quite easy to be vaccinated these days. Um, yeah, and, and AFD, I think, is today more an East German party. In some states in East Germany, the AFD had the majority of votes, more than 30%. And sometimes they won almost all constituencies in uh, Saxony, in Thuringia, in, in these areas. And why are they so popular? I think it has to do with the socialist authoritarian heritage, maybe because people in the eastern part of Germany feel marginalized still after more than 30 years. Um, because the Christian Democrats and social Democrats are not well rooted in these areas, the Green Party is almost not at all. So different things, but the, the eastern AFD is uh, 
in large parts, I would say even neo-fascist. Yeah, not not only conservative, conservative nationalist, like mostly in in the western part, but there are politicians who are fascists. Yeah, and obviously they can even they can find majorities. Yeah, it's it's. It's a bit strange, but AFD is weaker than in 2017, and I expect them to stay there with around 10% for the next years. But I don't see that a right-wing populist movement is really able to win majorities at the federal level in Germany, unlike countries like Austria or maybe France with uh, Le Pen or some Scandinavian countries. Yeah. No, I think, but they can win at state elections. Yeah, but then there would be a grand coalition against the AFD. No other party in uh, the national and the state parliaments is willing to build coalitions with AFD because this is a, in parts, fascist party. So, are these the questions you? post maybe on, on corona corona the corona policy of the german government was okay but it was also not very good i mean they bought vaccines via the eu but the vaccines came a few months too late the in the united kingdom for example they started the vaccinations two months earlier on israel so Although the BioNTech vaccine was uh, produced in Germany, we were a bit late. And that was because of mistakes by the health ministry and, and by the federal government in general. And then the, uh, the coordination of the whole vaccination and everything between the federal level and the state level was very difficult and complex and slow. So people were not really, really fully satisfied. Yeah, but I think because we had a grand coalition, it was CDU and SPD, both parties maybe have lost a little bit because of these um, slow responses by the government. Yeah, and the other smaller parties have won because of that. Yeah. It's always the case if you have a grand coalition, then the smaller parties at the margins win a little bit at least yeah because they can all the time criticize the government and sharpen their their profile their programmatic profile and and the parties within the grand coalitions always have to compromise and and compromises are often very uh, lame and unsatisfying results of of policy debates or of negotiating now but okay. yeah okay uh, there's one one question by Aska Abdi Amru Robi oh okay maybe you can read it ah, okay yeah yeah seven parties or the uh, seven parties in the German parliament are two parties with the most seats. How about the effectiveness of that parties? Oh, related, oh, agreeing on policies. Yeah. No, we will have a coalition. Yeah. CDU, SPD, Nick, wrong. SPD, Green Party and uh, the um, Liberal Party. And they will negotiate for the next five six seven eight weeks and they will come up with um very clear details on what they want to achieve and then they have a majority for the next four years and they will come up with their policies um i think this is not really difficult but there are major differences for example between especially between the green party and the liberal party yeah, the Green Party wants quite fundamental uh, climate change policies. The Liberal Party, not really. The Liberal Party is more pro-market, pro-entrepreneurs, uh, and they want, well, I think 
a slower response to, to climate change. And there are many other things. Uh, for example, in terms of, in terms of taxes, the, the Social Democratic Party wants um, higher taxes because they think we don't have enough money yet. But the, the Liberal Party is almost always against taxes at all. Yeah, they don't want to raise taxes. So it will be very difficult and they have to find compromises. And yeah, that, that's quite cumbersome. Yeah, but I think it was always the case. Even in the 1960s, 70s, there were coalitions between CDU and the Liberal Party, SPD and the Liberal Party, and they also had to find the same compromises. I think the number of parties as such is not so difficult. I mean, if you have three parties, like in the 70s or now seven, eight, um, it also has, has some advantages. I, I have to um, add that the left party only did four point, did get only 4.9%, but they are nevertheless in parliament because they have won three direct mandates, two in, in Berlin, I think, and another one somewhere in East Germany. And if you get three direct mandates, you can enter parliament yeah, with more than 30 members. That's one exception to the 5% threshold. And then there's a very, very small party in Schleswig-Holstein, where I am originally from, that's so-called South. It's a kind of, of, of Danish party. Yeah, there's a very small minority in the northern part people of Danish Danish origins, and they have one seat for the first time in, in, in German history, I think. Um, actually, they, they got maybe 0.5% or something like that. So the, this, these are two exceptions to the 5% threshold. So actually, we have eight parties, I think, with this small party. Um, but, but I think it's more interesting in, in the 70s, it was all about these two and a half parties and it was a bit boring, but now you have really different, really different policy positions and you can choose between many different um, parties. And in Indonesia, it's of course totally different. First, the programmatic profiles of these nine parties are not always clear. First and second, there's the tendency to build rainbow coalitions so that almost every body and every party is, is part of the coalition. That's not the, the case in the usual parliamentary systems like in Germany. You need 50% plus a little bit and that's, that's the minimum winning coalition. And that's the best solution because if you, if for example, they would integrate the Christian Democratic Union, in a four-party coalition, it would be almost impossible to come to rational policy solutions because then you would have a compromise of everything that, that would be very difficult. So the, the Indonesian system is a bit strange to me, the, these rainbow coalitions. I do not really know why. Uh, I think I just have written an a paper on that. There was a critical juncture from 1998 until 2004 because of the fall of Abdurrahman Wahid. Megawati thought she needs broad support, otherwise she could be voted out by, I think, still by the NPR. And then Susilo Bamangyutuyono inherited this, well, political culture or this fear of, of being. Um, toppled. And still today, you have these grand coalitions. Now, because of the polarization, you need to inter integrate Prabowo and, and the, let's say, conservative Muslims uh, in order maybe to avoid the polarization in society, yeah? so that people are mobilized against Jokowi, for example. So he integrates almost everybody. But this is not the case in Germany, yeah? mm, because this kind of mobilization is hardly possible outside of parliament. Yeah, it is possible. Rido talked about Pegida. Pegida is now dead, but Pegida was a kind of 
right-wing social movement against the government, but that was only in parts of, of Germany, I think. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it's difficult to assess the, the relationship between the electoral system and the system of government and the party system and how these different systems interact and what happens if you change the electoral system a little bit? Yeah, what will happen with the party system and the political parties? It's very difficult to foresee and, and to know in advance what, what will happen. Uh, like in Indonesia, you invented or you, you um, introduced the open list. Yeah. And of course, open list has many advantages because you can um, have more choices. But on the other hand, there's a competition um, among candidates of the same party. And this disintegrates uh, yeah. political parties at this level. So I would be against an open list in Germany. That would be, mm. oh, I think that would be very bad, yeah. So, but these these very tiny reforms can have very um, very far-reaching results. You know? So you have to be very very careful in reforming electoral systems. You know? So, but if there are no other questions, I can also tell you what I will be doing uh, the next week or the next weeks. So, so next week I would like to talk about the plurality or majoritarian system in Malaysia. This is a very good example for a pure plurality system with 222 constituencies and one is elected in each constituencies, but also um, the relationship between this electoral system and the party system. Usually, according to a French scholar Duverger, we would expect a plurality system leads to something like a two-party system, yeah, because you have two major candidates in each constituency and so on. But no, in Malaysia, you have many, many, many different parties, I think 20 or 30, I mean, at least at the state level. And this has to do with cleavages, ethnic and religious cleavages, and how this interacts is quite interesting. And well, and I could, of course, talk about the 2018 elections because these elections are also very interesting because for the first time in Malaysian history, uh, the hegemonic party, AMNO, United Malays National Organization, lost and the opposition, Pakatan Harapan, won for the first time after 61 years. And how did this happen and why was this possible? I mean, now, since a few weeks, you again have an AMNO prime minister, Ismail Sabri. So AMNO came back, but there will be elections next year. And then it will be very interesting to see what, what happens, because now the elections are really very competitive in contrast to the 1970s, 80s, 90s, and so on. Yeah. So... I would talk about Malaysia and the plurality system. And then the last session, of course, about the systematic, the classification of systems. I'm still working on that. Yeah? I or also do not fully know how to classify best all these different systems. And in between on presidential elections in Indonesia and I think also the Philippines, but maybe mostly on Indonesia, because it's more interesting for you, I think, and and also about the relationship between presidentialism, presidential elections, and political parties and the party system. Yeah, because some experts would say it's not good for the party system, for the rootedness of political parties and programmatic profiles and so on. But we can talk about that. And then there was another session. I'm not quite sure. Ah, and on party funding, yeah, systems of party funding. Um, so state funding, is it useful, private donation? How do parties spend money? What different types of regulations are there? 
and I'm referring then mostly on the international idea um, homepage because they have all these data and they have some very interesting uh, articles and books on that. Um, yeah, these would be the five sessions. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thank us, you uh, for the first warming up sessions. Yeah, <laughs> warming up sessions, <clears throat> and we still have the other four other meetings uh, in the different topics. I think maybe just one question: If any one of you uh, wanna ask to uh, our speaker today, anyone? Maybe. Okay, I think. Oh, Salsa, yeah. This one, Andrea. It, oh, yeah. It is about uh, my, my curiosity trip. about how the yeah. communities of okay. party in Germany gain the really Do they, yeah, do they, by giving the society something in exchange? Ah, okay. You mean vote buying? No, no vote buying in Germany. If you mean that, yeah, giving the society. In exchange to get the vote or doing, uh, professor, does I know that they are yeah, okay? If you mean by giving something in exchange, if you mean vote buying, no, vote buying in Germany is, is not possible. I mean, there are of course electoral campaigns, and the candidates, for example, in my constituencies, have posters everywhere. There are some events. I haven't been there, but. Um, yes, they socialize, they um, tell people what they want to achieve, but it's, it's mostly exactly the same what the party wants. So these people are representing their parties. And if you know the party, you usually know what the candidate wants. So in, in, in my case, this woman of Turkish origin, Uzugus, I've seen her her a few times on TV, but that's mostly it, uh, because she was even quite influential within the party. Most people you do not know, even not not from from TV. Um, and and candidates get money from their party to finance their own campaign, and the the party gets the money from the state mostly. And sometimes the candidates use their own money yeah but not so much yeah but sometimes they do that um but usually it's the party and then they get um people from the party they that support the electoral campaign yeah um that's mostly it um or do they have another way to gain it no, I think sometimes it's door to door campaigning. They knock and then they say who they are. But in my case, there was no candidate here um, coming to my house. So I think there was not much door to door campaigning. And then we have a central place. I think there the political parties would give posters or some brochures. But because of Corona, I hadn't never been to the city, actually, yeah, maybe once in, in three months or two months. And so I this time the, the candidate, the, the whole campaign was not really visible. So the campaign, I think, is mostly on TV. Yeah, on TV, you see these leading members of the political parties every day. And, and there are debates on TV among the chancellor candidates, but also among representatives of the party, also very often. That's very important. Social media actually are, I think, less important in Germany than, for example, in Indonesia. Yeah, in countries like Indonesia, Philippines, Thailand, and so on, the impression is that WhatsApp and YouTube and Facebook and so on are Instagram are very, very important during electoral campaigns in Germany, not really. I mean, it's mostly TV. Um, maybe I'm, I'm wrong, but that's my impression. And that's also what I have read. The parties are quite 
um, weak in terms of campaigning via social media. The exception is the AFD, the right-wing populist party. There, uh, or the AFD campaign is mostly a social media campaign, I think, yeah, because they also don't have the apparatus like, like the other parties. But, but for example, there was one, uh, one young German who criticized the Christian Democratic Union on YouTube very heavily, and he had a few million clicks. And the Christian Democratic Union with 500,000 members was not really able to react. Then there was one member of parliament of this party who tried to react via YouTube, but this failed altogether because it was done so stupidly. That means the, the big parties in Germany are not very smart in using social media. Yeah? So it's easy to attack them via YouTube, for example. Okay, well, I think uh, that's enough today. So, well, almost one and a half hour, yeah, we have uh, the sessions. So, I think uh, it is really interesting to be uh, know about the uh, German elections with a flat MMP uh, system. However, that's uh, Dr. Ufen wanna wanna suggest to change to the uh, open list PR yeah I think this is really interesting yeah if it is possible but let me know what what's going on in the further election in Germany so uh, thank you very much uh, Andreas for uh, joining with us today uh, all folks in Germany is still morning I uh, think uh, almost uh, 10 p.m. 10 a.m. Yeah, and uh, already uh, all uh, not yet. Yeah, uh, winter in December. I will got yeah, <laughs> not yet winter. I mean winter in December. It's so autumn. It's autumn. Yeah, in December. Yeah. So, but a little bit. Uh, yeah, a little bit. Uh, Sometimes rain, raining, yeah, it's a little bit cold, yeah. Yeah, it's around 15 degrees today. That's okay. Yeah, yeah. Around, around 15, yeah. Oh, that's a good, uh, that's good a good uh, situation, yeah, a good weather. Thank you very much, and uh, also thank you for all uh, participants, yeah, and also some of them uh, is NGO activists, yeah. Mas Aska is NGO activist. Uh, Mas Trapsi Haryadi is commissioner in the region of Sleman. And some of them uh, students, yeah. Okay, so thank you very much all the students and the participants and also Mbak Adiba and Mbak Nawang, yeah. As Writer today. Once again, thank you for Andreas, and we will meet again in the next uh, sessions on the same day and the same date, uh, but the different link Zoom, Zoom link. Yeah. So thank yeah. you once again, and uh, we move to the other sessions uh, after Andreas' uh, sessions. Thank you very much, Andreas. Okay. Bye bye. Thank Bye. you.